Hey guys, so I had time for another video and um, I'm gonna try to edit these and get them up hopefully tomorrow. When I go home tonight, I'm gonna edit them and then hopefully load them tomorrow. But um, in searching through different websites, I came across the story of Christine Fowling. Now Christine Fowling um, was in prison in Florida. I was looking for something, uh, my lip hurts, looking for something in um, on the internet about Florida, how far something was from something else. And um, her name has been on a couple of websites that I've run across before. And this particular one gave a, a better compiled story about who Christine Fallon was. And then I did some digging and some research and got some more information. So Christine Fallon, Falling, F-A-L-L-I-N-G. I will probably say Fallon quite a bit. Um, it's that Southern twang I think I put on things. Southern um, Christine Fowling. She was originally born Christine Laverne Slaughter. And her birthday is March 12, 1963. She was born in Perry, Florida. Perry County. Or Perry. Was it Perry County? Oh, Perry, Florida. And she was born to a family that was below poverty line. So um, they were one who her family was one who would need extreme assistance and her mom Ann was 16 when she was born and her father Thomas was 65 do that math please her father was 65 and her mom was 16 um, it strikes me as absolutely disgusting for one and for two um, I feel like part of me wants to think that they were related and you'll see why. Oh, I just got a text message right in the middle of my video. Um, you'll see why when I get through this. So I have my notes over here and I'm going to have to refer to them because I just, um, I put this on my WordPress and I printed out what I had compiled together so that I would have the dates and times and um, be able to refer back to it. So, um, like I said, Christine was born into this family and they were extremely poor and she had an older sister named Carol. I couldn't find how much older. I want to say it was about two years older than her. Um, but regardless, she was born in 63 and um, in looking up information on her, what I could find was she was born um, delayed. She had epilepsy. She was morbidly obese most of her life. She um, was not from what some of the people reported when they were like talking to people that had lived in the towns with her they would all say you know she wasn't the best thing to look at she's kind of homely looking um, a lot of people reported that she just had kind of like a vacant stare and that she was not very um, connected and that comes into play later as well um, it was determined that she had never progressed past a sixth grade intellectual level so in conversation and vocabulary and things she was not any higher at any point than a sixth grader um i don't know about like right now i couldn't find anything current on her today i plan on going back and doing some more research um but records show that her mom ann would often leave and go um for months at a time and be gone for work now, with them living in Florida, the only kind of work I could figure that she was doing where she would have to leave is maybe if she was working in some of the groves. Um, they would do seasonal work where you would go and you would stay in workhouses. And um, in the workhouses, a lot of things happened. I'm trying to get my phone to stand up a little bit better so that I'm not gonna end up dropping you guys. It just seems like it's tilted so far up and you're getting more ceiling than, okay. I feel like that's a little bit better. Um, anyway, she would leave and she would go to work and she would be gone for months at a time. And then when she would come back, there was twice that she came back that she was actually pregnant when she came back and not when she left. So she had um, Christine's younger brother, Michael, my younger brothers, Michael and Earl. Okay, sorry. So where I left off. Um, so Christine had two younger brothers. <clears throat> there is my voice. And, um, 
their names were Michael and Earl, and Thomas, the father, who was 65, the only child that he claimed out of all four of them was Earl, the youngest one, which is odd because she left and was not pregnant and came back and was pregnant, and yet Thomas claimed Earl. But at 65, he could have had dementia at that point. Um, now, Thomas did some sort of logging, land clearing type work where he worked um, in the woods is is what was reported in all these different websites that I found and all the documentation and stuff. And reportedly when Ann would go away and work, again, I'm assuming my opinion, I don't, I couldn't find anything to validate it, but when she would go away to work for these periods of time, Thomas would have to care for the children and he would kind of, um, have Christine step up and take on that motherly role and then all the children would have to go with him every day basically and stay with the stay in the woods all day while he was working and then he had some sort of on-the-job injury couldn't find any details on that either um, but he had some sort of on-the-job injury and after that Anne had to come back from wherever she was and she had to stay home and they had these four children well in this time um, they, they would kind of shuffle the kids off to different places to different um, family members and have them care for them for a little bit and then they would come back home when that family member was not able to care for them anymore. So one of the family members that Carol and Christine went to, they went together, was um, Jesse and his wife Dolly Fowling. So Christine was born Christine Slaughter and sent to a family member who his name was Jesse and he was related to her mom Ann, um, probably a cousin. And um, he was married to Dolly. Well, Jesse and Dolly could not have children of their own, and so eventually, after this shuffling back and forth, Carol and Christine were both adopted by Jesse and Dolly Fowling. And um, they took the girls in, and it was said that um, home life was really rough. The girls were rebellious, and they were hard to control, and um, kind of did their own thing. Now, you have to remember, their mom had not been extremely active in raising them, and so, um, I, I wouldn't see it have I wouldn't have seen it going any other way um, the girls were rebellious and so eventually um, there was a pastor in the town who um, had seen some of the abuse the the signs of abuse on the girls and the neglect and things like that and he approached Jesse and he was like look you you have to do something um, I'm getting ready to turn you into the authorities and so they sent the girls to um, I'm looking for the name Great Oaks Village in Orlando, which was an orphanage, and um, Carol and Christine were sent there. Christine was around nine when she was when her and Carol were sent. And while in the orphanage, um, social workers made notes in Christine's folder in her chart that said that um, there was suspected sexual abuse against her and her sister Carol from Jesse, that there was evidence of physical abuse, that Christine throughout her entire stay there was a pathological liar, that she would do things just to get attention, she would act out and she would do things she knew she wasn't supposed to just, just to have somebody pay some kind of attention. And if you know anything about abused children, any attention is better than no attention, even if it's negative attention. Um, that's true pretty much with any child, I think. They will do things that they know they're not supposed to just to get your attention. Um, and she was a thief. Well, while she was there, she, again, was obese, and she was not the prettiest girl to look at. Um, she was very plain, and so she was picked on a lot by the other children that were in the orphanage, and this caused her to act out even more. Well, at this point, when she was nine, some of her acting out included killing cats, and she would take them to the rooftop of the buildings of the orphanage, and she would strangle them, and she called it loving on them, and then she would take cats that were not strangled and drop them off of the rooftops of these very high buildings to check to see how many lives they had left because she had heard the cats had nine lives. And needless to say, none of these cats made it out alive. Um, and this was documented in, in her chart, and so I find it hard as a mom and as a nurse that someone did not intervene and that there was not more um, intense help provided for this young lady who was epileptic, 
um, very regressed. At the age of nine, she wouldn't have even been at a sixth grade level. She would have been like a four or five year old toddler acting out and being rebellious and doing these things. And nobody stepped up. Nobody saw the signs and, and the people who did see the signs and documented the signs did nothing further. And so I feel like um, some of the rest of what follows is actually society. And um, we'll get into that in a minute. So they're at this um, orphanage and they're there for a year. For one year. They are provided meals, schooling, clothing, and a roof over their head. And a year later, it's all taken away from them and they are sent back to Jesse and Dolly. Jesse, who had been sexually and physically abusing them. Dolly, who um, pretty much ignored them. Even though she couldn't have her own children, um, she didn't necessarily bond with these girls and create any, any kind of a connection with them. Probably should like, I uh, can't, we all know what it is, whatever. Not spons, not sponsored, just an addict. Um, so after a year being at the orphanage, they're sent back to Jesse and Dolly and the sexual abuse stops, he's been reported. And so he's, you know, not willing to lose the little bit of stuff that he does have and he definitely doesn't wanna to go to prison. So the physical abuse continues and is horrific. And in one of the incidents that was reported, um, he mercif mercif mercifully, merc he, why can I not speak today? Horrifically, <laughs> say that word um, he horrifically beat the girls for you know a, a period of about 10 minutes and then um, absolutely made Carol wear shorts the next day to show off the markings which doesn't make any sense it doesn't make any sense but we're not talking about highly educated people or people with common sense I mean you've had sex with your your niece so you're not really thinking too hot but um so he beats them and then makes her wear shorts to show off her what he called justice marks. I don't know of any child who could do anything that you would need to leave justice marks. Like I don't, that phrase just sticks with me throughout the, the research that I've done. Um, so the next morning, Carol and Christine decide to run away. Christine um, followed Carol, I feel like. I don't I don't feel like it was her idea. I think probably Carol was like, you know what, I've had enough of this. I'm not putting up with this anymore. This man has had sex with me. He beats on me. He sends me away. He brings me back. I'm basically like a slave in his home. And so she takes off. Carol and Christine go to stay with a friend of Carol's. They stay there for about six weeks and then Christine decides, you know what, I'm gonna go find our mom and I'm going to Bluntstown. Florida and that's where mom was supposed to be and so I'm just gonna go find our biological mom and she takes off at the age of 13 by herself and goes from Perry Florida to Bluntstown Florida to go find her mom well when she gets there um, she finds her mom and her mom has remarried is no longer married to 65 year old dad who's aged up along with the girls and I don't know if he passed away or I don't know um, but her and her husband I guess her husband that she married had um, some children of his own. And at 14, they forced Christine to get married. It is speculated, not proven, that she married her stepbrother. His name was Goober Fowling. Fowling, F-A-L-L-I-N-G. We're talking like hills have eyes and breed kind of, you know, everybody's kind of connected here. Um, their marriage lasted six whole weeks because their marriage was so tumultuous. It was nothing but physical fights. Um, Christine actually picked up a 25 pound radio and threw it at his head. And while she was dense and regressed, she was in protection mode, pretty much I'm, I'm assuming her whole life. And so that marriage ended. Um, when the marriage ended, she went into this hypochondriac state where she would fabricate things that were wrong with her and take herself to the hospital um, and seek out consolence from medical professionals. And she would do things like go in and tell them, I have, I have horrible vaginal bleeding. 
and they would check her out and she would just be menstruating and she would go in and say I have a snake bite I'm gonna die it was a, a poisonous snake and it was where she had taken her nails and dug into herself um, so she was clearly exhibiting some signs of Munchausen not Munchausen by proxy Munchausen where you um, you you seek out people to console you and usually it's medical professionals um, for things that don't really exist and she was not getting the validation that she needed in one year um, I keep looking that way because again I'm hearing things out in the corridor and I don't like it um, in one year she checked herself into the hospital 50 times in one year granted I mean if you think about it, it's 365 days in a year and 50 times is not once a day but it was multiple times each month she was going to the hospital with these fabricated illnesses or conditions that she did not receive one single diagnosis for. Not one single thing in an entire year was validated by any of the medical staff, but she had 50 visits to the same hospital. So why did someone at the hospital not realize, hey, this, this young girl, she's 14, and she keeps coming in okay she's 15 and she keeps coming in and she keeps making up this stuff and like there's nothing wrong with her like can we get a psyche valve on her um, again a missed opportunity right a missed opportunity and so she had some run-ins with the law she had um, she has a sealed record from before she was 18 where she had six charges against her and at, at some point she had spoken with a, a psychologist um, later on after the murders and had said that her record was sealed because she was um, she was deemed a delinquent and subject to run away again because she had run away from home um, on one of the times where she had been uh, arrested and check fraud somehow she had gotten a hold of uh, an elderly person's checkbook and had written some bad checks and so she already was in the legal system six times before she was 18 at the hospital 50 times before she was 18 in an orphanage with documented charting that she was a pathological liar that she was killing animals there were so many things that were missed and if not missed just ignored because of the poverty level um, not only of her family and all the inbreeding um, but the town and, and the area as a whole was just very um, poor. So she had completely dropped out of school. She'd been married and the marriage had failed and she decides, I've got to support myself. I got to come up with something. And somehow she comes up with the idea to become a babysitter. She was not the most um, conversational person having a, um, Having a deficit like she did, I'm sure that making a grocery list was very hard for her, much less carrying on a full conversation with an adult who had any kind of education. So she's dropped out of school and she decides, I'm going to be a babysitter. So, <clears throat> 1980, okay? Not really that long ago. I mean, I remember 1980 dancing around to Madonna and having a great time and doing my hair, you know, big huge like I remember 1980 it was not that long ago and she was asked to babysit um, again she is you know living in Florida and she's asked to babysit a child by the name of Cassidy Johnson and they called her muffin she was two um, and her parents left her with Christine and on February 25th of 1980 they rushed the child to the emergency room. Um, the child was diagnosed with meningitis. And then in another document, I saw it was meningitis due to severe head trauma. There were lacerations and bruises on her scalp. And she died three days later. When asked about it, Christine tearfully told them that she had put the baby in the crib and... Um, the baby had fainted and fallen out of the crib, which is how the head trauma happened. And she must have fainted because she has meningitis. 
one of the doctors in the ER, now you have multiple police officers and you have social workers there and you have the parents of this child who was not sick when they left her. Um, you have multiple people in this area and then all of a sudden the, the doctor writes on a pad of paper and he slips this police officer a note that says, I, I can't, and I couldn't find the note verbatim, like what he actually wrote, but paraphrasing, it basically says, I don't believe her, you need to check her out. There's something wrong with her story. I don't believe this. But the medical examiner and the coroner put the cause of death as complications of meningitis. So, Christine Fowling walks out of the hospital scot-free. She's not been charged with anything, and this two-year-old has passed away. Well, <clears throat> not long after the death of Cassidy Muffin Johnson, um, she was asked to babysit a four-year-old named Jeffrey Davis. Again, if I'm looking down, I'm getting my names and my dates and, and things like that correct because the general story I can tell you. Um, so she's asked to babysit this four-year-old who is perfectly healthy, perfectly normal, and when his parents come home, Oh, I hope that comes up in this video. I really can't wait to edit this so that I can see if those bangs are coming up. I'm on the third floor of a building by myself and there should be no, um, with the exception of somebody who knocked on my door, there should be no one in the hallways. Anyway, so um, they leave a perfectly healthy four-year-old boy with this girl come home and he's deceased. Um, no, he was non-responsive. Oh, I'm not even going to bother editing that out. I get so excited about the details that I, I skipped ahead. Um, he was non-responsive. So they take him to the emergency room and they say that it is um, myocarditis. Basically an inflammation and infection of the heart. And he dies. So they have the funeral three days later. No investigation is being done because it was an infection of his heart. Nothing else was checked. Nothing else was documented. It was an infection of his heart. So three days later, during his funeral, Christine was asked to watch his two-year-old cousin, Joseph, because his family didn't want to take him to the funeral to the services. I can I can see why a two-year-old probably would not be able to sit down long enough and everybody crying and grieving. It could be traumatic and, and scary for a two-year-old. So they leave the baby with Christine. They come home and he's dead. Christine says he was napping and he was fine and he he was fine when I laid him down for the nap. He just didn't wake up from the nap. I mean, he just didn't wake up. No investigation was done. No investigation was done. This is in the same town, okay? This is the third child that she has babysat. Two of them are within three days of each other. And nobody has said, how come all the kids that this chick keeps watching keeps dying? I get it, it's the 80s, I get it. I mean, we were worried about, are eggs gonna give you cancer? Should you eat butter? This is your brain on drugs commercials. Like we had big things going on, right? But this is the same county, the same police. And we are on our third child that has fallen um, to a tragedy that has succumbed to death under the same babysitter not even a police officer and I think I would question that a little bit right so um she you know she has a big tearful story that she tells about Joseph and oh I didn't I didn't know anything was wrong with him and and you know his cousin just died from this heart infection what if he has an infection well sure enough the medical examiner and the coroner say he died from a viral infection which possibly could have been secondary to the myocarditis that um, had taken the life of Jeffrey. So everybody's just apparently got this super bug going around that infects your heart, only Joseph's heart wasn't infected, it was just a viral infection that killed him and made him stop breathing, right? Okay, 
We've missed all these signs. We've, we've led ourselves up to, to this point and we still haven't caught on. And I don't know if it's because she was dementally retarded, if it was because she was 17 at this point. She was 17 when she started um, babysitting. Or she was 16 when she started babysitting. And 17 when she was caught. Um, but we, all this stuff is going on and nobody is questioning anything. Nobody is saying why. Why are all these kids that have this, this, what's the common denominator? Isn't that the first thing that investigators ask is what's the common denominator? And they missed something that big that every single one of them had been alone in a house with Christine Fowling? Okay, so a couple weeks after the funeral for Joseph, um, family friends of Joseph, the two-year-old, asked Christine to come watch their two boys who are 14 months and three. So Charles Heal and his brother Jeffrey, different Jeffrey, um, Car Charles was three and Jeffrey was 14 months. Um, the parents leave. They are perfectly healthy. They are happy little boys. They are playing. She, the parents come home and they're non-responsive. Take them to the emergency room. The emergency room admits them into the hospital and says they have a viral infection. I'm a nurse. Every time I send one of my residents to the emergency room for something, it could be tachycardi, bradycardi. Um, it, it could be any number of things. I send them to the emergency room and the first thing that they say when I call for a report, hey, this is Nurse Tafoya and I'm calling because I'd like to get an updated status on my patient, Joe. It's a UTI. It's a UTI. During certain seasons, it's pneumonia, but almost always it's, and a UTI. So I get that. I get that the hospital was giving everybody these viral infections, okay? But again, we have, this is, this is five kids now. Three are dead, two are in the emergency room. Common denominator, Christine Fallon, right? Luckily, these two made it. Luckily, these two survived. Not long after they came out, Christine herself gets ill, goes to the emergency room, is checked in, and diagnosed with viral infection of her intestines. So everybody says that this girl's mentally retarded, that she's not any higher than a sixth grader, that she has trouble conversing, <coughs> and that she's just not bright. That's what everybody says about her, that meets her and knows her, right? But she's a great babysitter, she's a great babysitter. All the kids she babysits comes up dead, but she's a great babysitter. She's on time, I guess, or something is the deciding factor. This girl wants to know if her bacteria infection is what caused all the other kids to die. Okay. Physician said that he can't say no and he can't say yes. He can't say that the um, that Jeffrey and Joseph, the two that passed away, the two boys that she, the cousins, can't say if it had anything to do. You know, maybe maybe she was a carrier. Um, she was not a carrier. These two that are in the hospital now, well, they have viral infection and you have viral infection and, and we can't test to see if it's the same one. I don't know why not. I mean, I know that we've had a lot of progression, a lot of progression, but we should be able to tell, right? Another sign missed. Right after this, she determines that she is no longer gonna watch kids. She is not gonna watch kids, and she leaves. So what does that tell you about her mind? I've killed three kids, almost killed two, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. I'm not keeping kids anymore, like I'm out of here, right? That does not say mentally retarded, regressed and, and impaired 100% to me, like a lot of these, um, areas where I did my research kind of played it up to be, you know, like, like she just couldn't get through the day without some extra help. I don't think she was that bad off. Um, my personal opinion. So she takes off 
and she heads back to Perry because she's in Bluntstown. She heads back to Perry, which she's been in before, right? So July of 81, she left Bluntstown. She goes back to Perry and took a job as a housekeeper slash caregiver for a 77-year-old gentleman. She interviews for the job. She gets the job. She shows up for the job. And he's dead that afternoon in his kitchen. No investigation was ever done because with his age, they assumed he had had a heart attack. He was 77. He was living by himself. He was not in good health. He needed a caregiver. So it was assumed that he had had a heart attack. No autopsy was ever done. <coughs> Nothing, right? Okay. The next and last victim in Christine's reign of terror was eight-month-old um, Jennifer Daniels. No, that's a lie. She was not the last one. She was the next one. Jennifer Daniels was the daughter of Christine's stepsister. Christine's stepsister asked her to go along with her. They go to town. They take the baby, Jennifer, to the health department. Again, they're low to no income. They go to the health department. They get their vaccinations for the baby. They head home. Stepsister says, oh, I forgot I need to stop by the store. Hey, do you mind just hanging out in the car since she's sleeping? Let me run in real quick. Stepsister runs in. I think I may have said sister-in-law earlier. I tend to do that sometimes in my videos. In my head, it all sounds right, and then I edit it, and I'm like, did I say that? It's the stepsister, if I did say sister-in-law. So stepsister runs into the store. Baby is perfectly fine. They just came from a health department visit. Comes back out, and lo and behold, her child is dead. medical examiner and coroner say complications due to immunization and vaccines that were administered that morning. No investigation, no anything. They questioned Christine and Christine said she was in a car. She was asleep. There was nothing wrong with her. Her mom came out and turned around and she wasn't breathing. That's all I know is she wasn't breathing. There are some reports that say the baby was in her arms which I mean, I'm not gonna 100% say that I don't believe because back then I remember riding in the back of uh, station wagons and hanging out the back window and like standing up in the back seat. And I, I guess I could have looked it up, but I didn't. I don't think car seats were mandated by law um, in 1980, 81 area. Um, this was 1982. I definitely know I was older, so I wouldn't have been in a car seat and I didn't didn't have a, a younger sibling um, that would have been in a car seat. So I don't know. I'll have to look that up later. You guys look it up. I don't know. Um, there were some reports that Christine was holding the infant and the infant was fine and the stepsister comes out and the baby's just not breathing. Here's your child. She's not breathing. Again, no investigation. Um, no, no follow-up. No no CS high, no, no criminal minds, nothing going on in that fashion, right? Um, her final victim, this was in July. So that was the fall of 81 that her stepsister, I don't think I said that, that was the fall of 81 that her stepsister had, um, lost her child. And, um, in July of 82, her final victim was a 10 week old little baby boy named Travis, Travis Coleman. <coughs> and his mom had had pneumonia and she had been really, really sick. And so she had asked Christine if she could keep the baby overnight. Christine says, sure, I can keep the baby overnight. No problem. Um, baby the next day, dead in the crib medical examiner coroner say SIDS. 10 week old baby, that's usually the first thing anybody thinks. And all of a sudden, some of the doctors and nurses at the hospital are like, hold on a second. 
He was perfectly healthy. And he's got some injuries that we can't really explain. So they do an autopsy. The autopsy shows uh, strangulation, smothering, internal hemorrhaging, and internal bleeding, which would not cause, that would not be SIDS, right? So the police start to ask Christine, you know, Christine, these, this baby doesn't look like he just fell asleep and, and died. Like, you know, originally we thought it was SIDS and now we're thinking something else might be going on. Do you know anything? And she was like, yeah, I killed him. Confesses. Confesses to the first child, um, her stepsister's daughter, and Travis. Doesn't confess to Jeffrey or Joseph or the attempted of the other two, of Jeffrey and his brother. Um, I've forgotten his name already. That's why I have notes. Charles. I don't know a Charles. That's probably why I can't ever remember his name. Um, but she confesses and says that she kills them. And she, so the medical staff didn't believe anything. They start prompting. So when asked, why did you kill him? Let me read this. She admitted to killing three of the children, saying she was reacting to the voices in her head that would tell her to kill them. The voices would chant, kill them, kill the babies. I wonder if the voices were chanting, kill them, kill the cats, when she was nine on top of the orphanage, strangling the cats and throwing them off to their death, and nobody stopped her and nobody helped her out then. Um, I feel like, you know, had some intervention been done at that time, we probably wouldn't have gotten to these five children who are now dead. But she said, the way I done it, I seen it done on a TV show. I had my own way though, simple and easy. No one would hear them scream. Calculated, meditated, vicious, vicious, okay? That does not sound like somebody who is mentally retarded to me or that suffers from all these um, deficits to a point where she can't clearly think her way through the fact that she murdered children and left the area, went to a new area, killed an old guy, and then starts killing kids again. I I'm not buying it. Um, she was sent to a mental hospital, which deemed she was not legally insane. She was sane. <clears throat> and while she stayed there, she admitted to them about her um, criminal past, the check fraud, having the sealed record, being abused by her relative, Jesse, and abused, I guess, mentally by his wife, Dolly. All, all of this stuff was coming out, but it was too late. Five children had already lost their lives and two more almost did. Two more almost did. There were signs all along the way. So during her incarceration, she finally admitted to all the murders. And this is kind of a paraphrase of how she described the uh, events leading up to her murdering each of them. Cassidy was smothered because she got rowdy or something. Now, please, let's, let's remember, um, Cassidy was two. Two. Cassidy, Muffin, Johnson. Got rowdy or something. Jeffrey made me mad or something. I was already mad that morning, and I took it out on him. I just choked him till he was dead. Jeffrey was four. Joe Boy, Joseph, his cousin was napping and I just got the urge and killed him. So he wasn't even rowdy. He wasn't even doing anything to make her mad. He was napping. She just went in and killed him. Jennifer, her stepsister's daughter, was crying and crying and it made me so mad I just put my hands around her neck and choked her till she shut up. That's the eight month old. That was her stepsister's daughter. Travis was sleeping, and I just, for no reason, I killed him. Again, another little boy. He was 10 weeks old, sleeping, not doing anything. 
She claimed the last time that she saw Travis before she finally admitted to all this was um, at 3 a.m. when she went in and changed his diaper and gave him a bottle. And I'm wondering, just me personally, I'm, I'm wondering if that's when she went in and smothered him. Because what they did find out was that she was taking blankets and pillows. Um, she did manually choke two of them, which being a nurse, um, there would have had to have been some petechiae. There would have had to have been some hemorrhaging in the in the facial, um, some some sort of mold like discoloration. There would have had to have been something, some bruising, something like. A 10 week old baby. Uh, she also admitted to killing the 77 year old man and saying that she choked him to death in his kitchen. Just because. Just because. <coughs> Just because. This, this story infuriates me on so many levels because had the social workers at the orphanage who are trained professionals that documented, they documented the things that she was doing and her personality disorders. They, she wasn't diagnosed, but it was documented. And they did not go above and beyond to make sure that she did not have an opportunity to hurt anyone or to hurt herself. And obviously if she's choking cats and throwing live cats off of tall buildings, she had potential and you're, you're trained to look for stuff like that. So I have a huge, huge, like, I'm, I'm infuriated that these people did not um, step in and do more and mandate that she had more therapy and, and send her to the psychologist. They sent her back to the abusive home where she had been taken out of, and then within a year's time of being returned to them, she's... She's living in another area of Florida that she took off to when she was 13 by herself. She's not in school. She's married to her stepbrother, cousin, who knows how the relation really was. Um, we do feel like he was related to her. Fowling was his last name. Um, I just don't have a family tree or else I would like climb through the branches with you. But she was returned to that home where she had all the abuse, went to go live with her biological mother from which she also received neglect and abuse, whether it was physical or mental, um, verbal, and then married off to her relative with physical abuse on both parties. Now she gave it back as much as she got it. I mean, she threw a 25 pound radio at him when she got angry and then she starts killing these kids and each time there was significant connect the dot kind of things. Like I said earlier, same county, same police officers, same hospital. And they never went, hey, wait a minute. This is the same babysitter. Like that, that never crossed anybody's mind. So she was eventually um, tried and convicted on the murder of these children and she was originally convicted on three the three that she confessed to originally and she got life sentence with possibility of parole after 25 years which would have made her eligible in 2007 which she did go sit in front of the parole board and was denied um they were putting her off for seven years so in 2014 she had another parole hearing and i legit could not find anything about it I searched all day and I'm going to search a little bit more um, in just a few minutes and see if I can pull up Perry and, and Bluntstown. Um, she was in Perry when she went to jail. So I'm trying to figure out like how to get the court documents and, and figure out about her second um, parole hearing. It doesn't say that she wasn't released and it does doesn't say that she was it doesn't say she was or wasn't released and there I couldn't find any documents so far so I'm gonna do some more research on that but I just want you to absorb the fact that we had all of these indicators all of these signs and symptoms as she was coming up 
and yet we just kept saying, oh, Christine, she's the ugly, homely, retarded one who, and I know nobody likes that word, but that is literally what they were saying about her. And I don't know if that's what protected her and kept her from the speculation, and with the exception of that first doctor who, instead of saying, I don't think that's what happened, and, per, and on that first child that died, when Cassidy was presented to the emergency room, he wrote on a piece of paper and gave it to a police officer and said, check her out, I'm not believing her story. Why did he not go to his medical director? Why did he not tell the police officer just say right then and we could have avoided the future deaths of all those other children and almost deaths of the two who actually made it? I'm just infuriated that, that everything was missed and or overlooked, whether purposefully or unperfectly unpurposefully um I feel like we assisted her in her reign of terror over these children and in one of the interviews she said God must have wanted me to do it if he didn't want me to do it he wouldn't have let me keep doing it that was that was, that was a statement she gave in an interview so there's there's a lot to that story. There's um, there's some moments where you're like, oh my gosh, this poor girl, you know, she's born with all these medical issues and, and she's got deficits and she's born into poverty and they can't afford her and they send her off and and she's abused. And, and then you have to look at it for what it is. She went into establishments 50 times to a hospital in one year looking for help. If that's not a cry for help, I don't know what is. And then in what in another interview that she had, she did um, tell a social worker there was a lady who was writing a book on her. Um, and I didn't get the name of the book. I was trying to research really fast. But um, she told this lady that she had actually tried to commit suicide several times by slashing her wrist, but she didn't really want to do it. Okay, you want to kill kids, but you don't want to kill yourself. That's, that's, there was huge signs of mental illness um, from a very young age. And I feel like she was, I feel like society let her down by not pursuing it and by not being um, more forceful with her staying at the orphanage. And if the orphanage wasn't gonna work out because she was a habitual liar and a thief and she wasn't getting along with the other girls, they could have um, sent her to a reform school or, you know, I don't know. I wasn't there. I wasn't there in 1980, 81 or 82. I lived in Tennessee at the time. I didn't live in Florida, so I don't remember any news about this. Of course, I was busy rocking out to um, music and wearing big hair, so I wasn't big into watching news, which is probably why I'm so intrigued with it now. But anyway, I hope you guys like this video. I'm going to edit this one and the other one, um, hence the same red shirt. There may be a third video with the same shirt because I am on the on a roll today but I'm gonna hop on here and see if I can find out if she was paroled or not so um, if you haven't go ahead and hit the thumbs up if you like the video subscribe I would love to have you stick around there will be many many more of these I'm gonna try to do um, several a week now I'm getting a little bit better with the research timing and things like that and if you can put up with my scratchy voice and my my clogginess until I get to that doctor's appointment next week then we're good so until I see you next time peace and palm okay guys one last little excerpt on Christine Fowling so 2007 was the first time that she was actually eligible for parole right so she goes in front of the judge and nobody else shows up um, to speak on her behalf I don't know who would have um, during her trial process the stepdad Jesse or adopted father Jesse said that he couldn't understand why she did this because she absolutely loved kids and that she was great with kids <laughs> this coming from the guy who had abused her right so then um, she gets denied in 2007 and she came up again in 2017 for parole and was again denied. And I did find this. Um, she was 19 when she pled guilty 
which is the only reason why they could charge her for the first three because all of the five children that she killed were, were natural causes is what was actually put on their death certificates. And um, the judge said, this woman killed five babies ages two months to four years old. Oh, this is the assistant state attorney. Um, she says she did it just how she saw it on TV, and she doesn't know why she did it. Sometimes they cried or made her mad, and one time she just felt the urge. And, like I said, nobody showed up to speak on her behalf. Go figure. But the judge said, um, try, where did I just see that? Basically, the judge said she deserved, oh, by law, Fowling remains eligible for parole, but prosecutors told the review panel that the so-called babysitter from hell deserves no mercy, and the judge agreed. And so her projected release date is 2254, which will be long after she dies, and she is going to receive another hearing in seven years. So her last hearing was 2017, it is now 2018, so in seven, in six more, no, it's 2019 now. Wow. It's early in January still. It's only the 13th of January. So I don't have to be, um, I, don't, I should remember what year it is. <laughs> but so in 2017, she was going to have another parole hearing in seven years. It's now 2019. So she's got five more years to go. And then she's going to have to stand up in front of the parole board again well, I think they actually sit down, but you know what I mean. Um, she's going to go in front of the parole board again, and um, I just don't see her getting out. I mean, I may be wrong, and in 10 years, 7 years, 5 years, whatever, maybe, you know, she's going to get out. Who knows? But that's where we stand now, so there's my um, little excerpt clip on that. And then if you guys want to, you can go to uh, WordPress, what is it, um... Nurse Nikki says at wordpress.com. Um, so it's nurse, N U R S E, Nikki, N I C C I says, S A Y S dot wordpress.com. Um, if you want to follow some of these intriguing things, I do some paranormal on there. Um, I haven't, I've just now gotten back on there, and so I cleared off all my old stuff and will be. Um, posting on WordPress almost daily. I will be doing unsolved mysteries, uh, missing persons, and things like that. And so if you'd like to join me on there, you can. And until I see you next time, peace and palm